Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here and to see the center get off the ground. Um, very exciting. Um, I'm talking on behalf of a large team. Well, to me, it seems like a large team at NASA. There are about 10 or 11 of us there. Um, we lead the Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab in conjunction with Google and USRA. And the first question I want to talk about is the question I always get asked first, which is, why is NASA interested in quantum computing? And some of you may remember the Mars rover landing, which, at least from anybody who didn't know anything about it, looked like there was never any chance that this was going to work. Um, it was this crazy thing with parachutes and sky cranes and things like this. Well, it worked. And how did it work? And fundamentally, there's a lot going on, but a lot of it is computation. And computational difficulties keep NASA from doing a lot of the things it would like to do, even though it has one of the top supercomputers in the world. And so what our team's mandate is long term is to understand what the potential is for quantum computation to enable more ambitious NASA missions going forward. So in the long term, we want to determine the breadth of quantum computing applications and explore particularly those applications that may help us at NASA, which is actually almost in everything. Um, and in particular, to evaluate quantum hardware as it comes online and also interact with quantum hardware folks uh, to say what we think would be most helpful here. And to make projections based on our fundamental understanding of the science here. So our initial target was quantum annealing, and this was because that was the first hardware available. And it was also the most prominent quantum heuristic, and I'll say more about that going forward. Um, and it's widely applicable to optimization problems. Uh, that said, it's unclear what the advantages are. Um, the early hardware has been very useful, and I'll talk more about what we've done and what others have done, um, has been very useful in developing intuitions um, and understanding the um, where those intuitions were not right and where we need to go in the future, um, and also what sorts of hardware people might build that might uh, help us get beyond this. Um, our next targets are emerging quantum computing hardware, so both more advanced quantum annealers and also small universal quantum computers that we expect to see in the next one to five years. Um, so the big question for us as, as theorists is what should we run on these uh, devices as they come on board? Um, it's frustrating that they are too small to be useful for solving any practical problems at this point. Um, so there are a couple answers. One is to just demonstrate quantum supremacy, demonstrate that there's something that can be done on these devices that cannot be done on conventional classical computers, even big, huge supercomputers. And that will be very exciting. We're more focused, we're interested in that, but we're mo more focused on using these small devices to develop intuitions for quantum heuristics going forward. And why is that such a big deal for us? Well, as many of you know, there are only, depending on how you count, a few dozen quantum algorithms that are known to provably provide a quantum advantage. On the other side, we know a few limitations of quantum computing, where we know there are problems where it basically won't help. And then there's everything else, which includes most practical problems, not everything, but most, and we just don't know. Will it help or will it not? And one thing that I find very um, encouraging is that most of the classical algorithms fall in this ca category. That most classical algorithms, um, it's very hard to obtain provable bounds. Um, the analysis is just too difficult. We don't know what the best 
classical algorithms are. There's ongoing development of classical heuristic approaches. They're analyzed empirically. Run them, see what happens. How do they do compared to last year's uh, methods? Um, that's why there are all these competitions there. And um, up till very recently, we have not been able to do this in the quantum computing community. We can only look at things that are provable or that you can run on 20, 30, 40 qubits. And what's really exciting is that we're getting to the point where we will have quantum hardware that enables the evaluation of heuristic quantum algorithms beyond where our classical simulation can take you. That said, it's really tricky to work in this space because it's heuristics. Um, I'm a mathematician. I really like to prove things, OK? But from a practical point of view, um, we also need to just have the guts to get out there and say, here's some intuition. Let's follow it and see where it goes and suggest that these might be th things that are good to run on this hardware. These other things are bad to run on this hardware. Let's try some things, see if our conjectures are right, and iterate. Okay. Um, so we need to generate hypotheses for how we're going to use these special quantum aspects for computation. That's unclear in a lot of cases. Um, uh, we can also look at the algorithms that exist and come up with algorithmic structures that encompass existing quantum algorithms. Or we can look at what we can build and say, OK, what looks to be the most powerful thing we could do with those things we can build? Um, and we also need to make compelling arguments for why these would scale up to larger size problems of application interest. So this is a hard area, um, because beyond that, we need to design experiments that we can run on near-term hardware that will actually give us insights here. Um, and then also do analysis and comparison with classical algorithms including those inspired directly by these intuitions. And while I'm phrasing that in a somewhat negative way, one of the most exciting outcomes already of quantum information point of view is that there are numerous quantum algorithms that have come out, sorry, classical algorithms that have come out of looking at the quantum, uh, at computation from a quantum point of view. So one of the things we were heavily involved with was looking at quantum annealing. And um, uh, it's a prominent qu quantum heuristic. There weren't proofs that it, did, uh, that it had an advantage. Um, many people, including us, I listed mostly our papers. There are many others um, uh, developing intuition for quantum annealing, um, including for uh, how quantum tunneling plays a role. Then there, were, then there was work. Um, uh, Vadim was actually at, uh, at NASA at this time, but is no longer there. So we had a little bit of a role in these things. Um, uh, showing, demonstrating um, tailored problems for quantum annealing. Okay? And we could show that, the, that this effect actually happened on these devices. Um, and then we can compare, the, I'm talking about the field, uh, we could compare with um, uh, various existing techniques. So if you compared to simulated annealing, it looked really good. If you compared to quantum Monte Carlo, you get the same scaling, but you get um, a huge positive um, constant. Um, and that's a, a quantum-inspired classical algorithm. Um, but then if you tailor the um, quantum Monte Carlo or other approaches to the, this particular problem or just to take advantage of things that look like multi-spin tunneling, you can do much better and bring it down to the quantum annealer performance level. Um, and then you can also do analysis and uh, recognize that, OK, maybe this isn't surprising because the exponential scaling of the escape rate in quantum Monte Carlo um, equals the tunneling rate in quantum annealing uh, for a specific class of problems. So where does that leave us for research directions looking particularly at optimization? Well, there are now, we're now developing new intuitions. Um, so we want to look at quantum annealing, maybe making use of higher energy states. So take, 
taking advantage, perhaps, of many body localization effects. Another one we've been very involved with is making use of them as samplers, where you're not just sampling from the ground state, but you're sampling from the whole Boltzmann distribution. Um, and another case is um, we can do more complicated quantum annealing with non-stochastic couplings, which people have been suggesting for a long time. They're harder to build, but also much, much harder to analyze and simulate. Um, and we're also looking at other heuristics for optimization. Um, I'll say more about these, but in particular, um, uh, we're looking at a gate model quantum approximate optimization algorithm and variational approaches. So current research thrusts are using quantum annealing as a sampler, particularly for machine learning applications. Um, the computational utility of many body localization, um, intuitions for quantum approximate optimization, um, also looking at hybrid quantum classical approaches. Um, we're also very interested in techniques for compi compiling quantum algorithms uh, to early quantum uh, computing architectures um, and advanced algorithms for simulating quantum heuristics as they arise. Those are our main thrusts. Um, very briefly on um, the quantum-assisted uh, Boltzmann sampling for machine learning, we have done some work here that um, establishes that you can use quantum annealers, even fairly primitive ones, to learn. And this was non-trivial because there was a particular pra parameter, the effective temperature, that needed to be estimated correctly, in or otherwise learning did not take place. So you can see some of the lines that uh, don't look so good are where the effective temperature has not been estimated correctly. Um, but if it's, if you, so people in my group figured out how to estimate that correctly, and then you can learn. And we're currently pushing that further to understand um, uh, how far you can go with Boltzmann sampling for um, machine learning. And I should say also that it's not clear that Boltzmann sampling is exactly what you want to be doing. And it's not clear that quantum annealers give you, gives you what sort of distribution it gives. So there are lots of unknowns both on the machine learning side and on the quantum annealing side. So this is a very rich um, area for, for research for us and for others. Um, we're also looking at um, heuristics from quantum uh, uh, approximate optimization circuits. Uh, this model was proposed by Farhi et al. Um, it basically iterates between two Hamiltonians. Um, one is phase separation uh, based on the cost function, and the other is a mixing term. And the intuitions for this come from myriad sources. So one of them is in the, um, for the many, many iterations uh, case, comes from adiabatic uh, quantum optimization. And you can use that to prove that, um, basically through trotterization, that the, um, the uh, for large P, this converges to the optimum. Um, on the other hand, for just p equals one, so no repetitions, um, the form is very similar, similar to IQP circuits, and it's been proven uh, through very similar techniques that it's hard to sample the output of these um, circuits efficiently classically. Um, and other intuitions come from uh, relation with variational eigensolvers. But still, we have challenges, including really getting a better um, uh, grasp of intuitions, especially for where probably is the richest uh, source of algorithmic um, complexity here, which is in the intermediate P region. We don't really want to do infinitely many iterations, and probably one isn't good enough for most things. So what can we do here? Um, parameter setting is very tricky here. Um, we have some thoughts on um, and have some preliminary results there, and also um, uh, classical um, theoretical and numerical analysis uh, in advance of being able to run on actual quantum hardware, and also designing what we should be running on quantum hardware to get more of these intuitions. Um, so we have um, some very preliminary results uh, um, uh, I'm very excited about them, so we have new results on MaxCut and also on unstructured search. And also for, um, we also have a framework for mapping many application problems to this formula, f formalism. Um, we're also looking at classical simulation techniques. Uh, there's pluses and minuses here. Um, 
uh, when you come up with better classical simulation techniques, you raise the bar so it makes it harder to do quantum supremacy experiments. But on the other hand, we should be fair here and try as hard as we can on that side. Um, but it also enables more classical um, uh, experimentation uh, while we wait for um, quantum hardware to get, uh, get there. Um, and we're, again, also very interested in, in compilation to early hardware and what, um, so comp compilation techniques to early hardware and what are the most sensible things to run there to give intuitions. Um, so very quickly, uh, we are, um, our, the application focus areas, um, uh, we've looked at mostly our planning and scheduling, fault diagnosis and machine learning. Um, and the outcomes of these application investigations are in the architectural designs and programming techniques and hybrid approaches. Um, just very, very quickly, we're looking at fault diagnosis um, uh, applications there. We have s some of the hardest, we believe the hardest systematic benchmarks in the area. Um, so that's exciting. And they're, for quantum annealing, they're actually not hard to embed on um, limited connectivity devices. So that's an exciting area of research. Um, we've also done a lot in scheduling applications, including coming up with benchmark tests, which were actually helpful for the classical um, folks to understand um, how well their um, planning and scheduling applications worked. Um, it was a different approach, and the problems we came up with enabled us to have a completely classical paper there. Um, and um, uh, we've seen structures common to many, many application problems coming out of there that would be useful as people are building hardware. Um, we're looking at quantum classical hybrid approaches. So for example, for quantum annealing, you can't prove that you get the optimum because it's a stochastic, uh, I mean, this is true for um, uh, classical techniques as well. So we're combining it with a complete um, a mes a method. And um, we have other ideas on ways of going forward for quantum uh, classical hybrids. Um, and we also uh, have some work uh, way down looking at um, modeling noise in um, superconducting flux qubits. Uh, there's um, 1 over f noise, except that uh, experimental results don't sh quite show 1 over f. They show 1 over f to some power less than 1. And um, a very elegant geometric um, explanation for why that power is less than 1 in terms of um, excess spins near the edge of a wire by taking uh, easy to do analysis on a cylinder, stretching it out to an ellipse, which uh, gives you an um, approximation to a, a wire. Um, and that's where I want to leave it. Um, I conjecture that, this, uh, that we will see a significant broadening of the applications in quantum computing um, in the next years as we get to play around with this hardware. And again, congratulations on the new center. We look forward to working with everybody here. Um, So thank you very much indeed, Eleanor. Uh, there's time for one or two questions. Yes. Get the mic first. I forgot to mention that we have a university industry engagement program if people are interested. So please ask me if you're if you're interested in in. Um, in doing some uh, collaboration under this aegis. I have a question. So I think it's uh, laudable that you're figuring this software side of the world out, right? And uh, machines get better and better and better, whether they're atoms probably or solid state. Uh, we don't know, but you know, I wonder I'll ask it in a kind of uh, what uh, comedic way. With my money as a as a uh, as a company or a program manager, should I be investing in hardware or software? So and and hardware I kind of know because I know these people and what are they doing. Software, how does one formalize and and um, 
give quantitative metrics of, yeah, this software really is better, quote, than that. And, and not in a so much problem specific, fine, because I'll have certain problems I want to solve. But in, in the, the world of computer science, how does one quantify goodness? So in an ideal case, you prove that it's better. But as I said, that almost always isn't the, what we can do for practical problems. And so then you have to run it and see what's going on. And you have to develop intuitions to figure out what you can run. Because this, the set of possible algorithms you can throw out there is beyond infinite, right? Um, in answer to your, the first part of your question, um, you have to fund both. Because hardware really isn't that useful unless there's software to run on it. And software really isn't that useful unless there's hardware to run on it. And both of them need really solid fundamental theory to back them up. And so if I was going to plug for anything, it's funding the fundamental theory that will strengthen both of those things. OK, there was one more question at the back. Yes. So out of that big, long list of quantum phenomena, which one is responsible for the power of annealing? Oh, Robin, I'm sure you know. <laughs> well, I was hoping there was some progress. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so who knows? Um, it's probably a combination and probably can't be that easily characterized. And I'll tell you that my favorite one is quantum interference. Very well. Let's thank Eleanor one more time. <laughs>